we must ask our quest, our, uh, a question of ourselves, and that is, what is microbial death? Because we may kill the bacterial cell, but if it produces an endospore, it could, so to speak, rise from the dead. So what is microbial death? Is it sterilization or is it disinfection? Well, the definition of microbial death is permanent loss of reproductive capability, even under optimum growth conditions. This means that you would be destroying endospores as well. So it is sterilization. Take a moment now to pause the video and see if you can name six factors that would govern whether a particular agent was effective or not. Think about in your day-to-day -day experience when you disinfect in your home. What are some of the things that would make the agent less effective? Go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can answer these six uh, factors. First of all, the number of microbes. If you have a lot of microbes to disinfect, it will affect the uh, how the agent is able to work. The nature of microbes. We just talked about how microbes fit into different resistance categories. A puddle of Pseudomonas is going to be a little bit more hard to kill than a puddle of E. coli. So the nature of microbes is important. Number three would be temperature and pH, so in the environment itself. Think about it, uh, a cold bucket of mop water versus a hot bucket of mop water. Which one would clean better? pH, think about extreme pHs. Extremely low or extremely high pHs are very good disinfectant agents. Concentration or dosage of the agent. This is very important, for example, with bleach. You may think uh, straight bleach would be a better disinfectant but actually a 10% dilute bleach solution is a better disinfecting agent than straight bleach. So concentration of the agent is very important. Also as you dilute an agent it tends to get less effective. Mode of action of the agent is number five and this means that how does the disinfecting agent work? Some agents are better at killing certain microbes than others depending on how they work. Finally, the last one is presence of solvents, organic matter, or inhibitors. Think about that mop, that uh, bucket of mop water again. What disinfects better, a bucket of clean mop water or a bucket of dirty mop water? The organic matter that gets into the mop water actually inhibits the disinfecting agent. So you want the clean bucket of mop water until you start disinfecting. Replacement of this disinfecting agent frequently as it becomes contaminated with organic matter is important in thorough disinfection. Many antimicrobial agents are very specific in what part of the cell they actually target. One of the cellular targets that's very common among disinfecting agents is the cell wall. The cell wall is a structure, remember, that uh, you don't have in eukaryotic cells. So if you have a chemical agent that targets the cell wall, it will be fairly specific for bacteria cells. The second one is the cell membrane. And if you look at the figure at the bottom left of this slide, you see a cellular membrane and you have molecules that have interrupted the cell membrane. These molecules are called surfactants. Surfactants basically lower the water tension and so it allows hydrophobic molecules like lipids, fats, and your cell membranes to dissolve in water when they normally wouldn't. A very common uh, use for surfactants are detergents and soaps in the home. That's exactly how they work. They disrupt cell membranes and they disrupt hydrophobic oils. The third uh, cellular target are cellular synthetic processes, so making DNA, making RNA, those agents tend to be fairly specific. We'll talk about UV light, for example. UV light breaks DNA, and therefore it specifically targets DNA processes. Finally, the image at the lower right-hand corner of this screen uh, in your notes shows a protein. Proteins are very popular targets for disinfectants. We can use various antimicrobial agents and physical means of control to target proteins. For example, if you apply heat or a low pH or a high pH, this causes proteins to completely denature. They lose their shape. And if you remember from our previous chapters, when a protein loses its shape, it loses its function. 
and a protein that doesn't function results in a cell that will eventually die. Even if the protein is able to fold back, it usually does not fold back in the correct shape and therefore won't function. Heavy metals also inhibit proteins. They inhibit proteins by blocking active sites in enzymes. If the active site where the substrate binds cannot be accessed, then the enzyme will not function. Now that you've been introduced to some terms about antimicrobial agents of control, and we've talked about some cellular targets of control, we're going to talk about some physical means of control. You're probably familiar with most of, most of these, and we'll just go over a few details. First of all, heat is an effective means of physical control of microbes, and there's both moist heat and dry heat, and we'll, we'll talk about the differences between those in a moment. Cold temperatures can control microbes, but they're usually not microbicidal. They don't kill microbes. They simply uh, stop them where they are, and they prevent them from dividing further. Desiccation is removal of water. Uh, freeze drying, for example, is a form of desiccation, or drying out meats and uh, fruits and vegetables in dehydrators. Those are also desiccation. They're effective as long as water is not added. Radiation is another means of physical control. It targets the DNA, for example. UV light is an example of that. And then filtration, both of liquid and air. And we'll talk about each of these more specifically. When we look at the relative effectiveness of heat, we see that moist heat and dry heat both have different applications. First of all, moist heat uses lower temperatures than dry heat. And you usually use shorter exposure times with moist heat. Dry heat use moderate to high temperatures, and you end up having to use longer exposure times. Moist heat works by coagulation and denaturation of proteins. What that means is it causes proteins to unravel, to melt, and then they stick together in large clumps. This is not good for protein function, and therefore it kills the cell. Moist heat also destroys membranes and DNA by denaturing these molecules. Dry heat works a little differently. Its mechanism is simply removal of water, dehydration. When you remove water from proteins, this also alters protein structure. Dry heat and moist heat can both be sterilizing. When we use moist heat along with high pressure steam called autoclaving, this can be sterilizing. Boiling, however, is not sterilization. Dry heat, if sterile, uh, if you're using it as a sterilization method, you would have to use what's called incineration. So you would apply dry heat until the material is reduced to carbon ash. It's not very useful after that, but it's a very cheap way to incinerate biomedical waste. If you look at the table here, we have thermal death times of various endospore forming bacteria, and you see Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus stereothermophilus, Clostridium botulinum, and Clostridium tetani. These organisms were subjected to various moist heat temperatures and dry heat temperatures. You'll notice that Bacillus subtilis actually uh, requires only one minute of moist heat, whereas it requires 120 minutes of dry heat. This is not always the case. If you look at Bacillus stereothermophilus, this organism only requires five minutes dry heat, but requires 12 minutes moist heat. And that's really, if you look at the name, Thermophilus heat lover, this becomes uh, more clear. Endospore forming bacteria especially, and these are all endospore formers, are very resistant to heat as an effective means of control. Moist heat needs to be used to kill spore formers. What form of microbe is most resistant to heat? Well, I've just mentioned that. Any organism that forms bacterial endospores usually require temperatures well above boiling. 